I don't know what those white people in this country feel. I can only include what they feel from the state of their institutions. Now, this is the evidence. If you want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never seen. Welcome to Black History for White People, a podcast where we educate, resource, and challenge white people about black history. I'm Brad, and on today's show are my co-hosts, Katina and Gary. Today, we are joined by Dr. Kwesi Kanadu. He is the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Endowed Chair and Professor at Colgate University, where he teaches courses in African history and on worldwide African histories and cultures. He's done extensive archival and field research in West Africa, Europe, Brazil, the Caribbean, in North America. His writings focus on African and African diasporic histories, as well as major themes in world history. He's the author of Our Own Way in This Part of the World, Biography of an African Community, Culture, and Nation. And today we talk about an article that he wrote a couple months ago called The 13th Amendment's Fatal Flaw Created Modern Day Convict Slavery. We hope you enjoy the discussion. So we have a very special guest with us, Dr. Kanadu. We're so excited to have you with us today. Um, and what I always start our interviews off with is the question of who are you? Who is Kwasi Kanadu? Um, because so many times, as I often say, people associate African Americans or Black people um, with the work that they do, specifically justice work, that becomes your entire identity. But of course, you're a person, you're a human being, you have a story, um, you have a life um, outside of what you do. So who are you? Appreciate it very much for having me. I am Kwesi Kunadu. First and foremost, I am a father and husband. My wife and I have um, three beautiful, intelligent daughters. And um, aside from being a parent, I'm also a healer that was um, trained in Ghana, West Africa, but also in Jamaica, where I was born through my grandfather. And so I come from a long line of healers in that regard. And then finally, I'm also a professor of African history and Africana studies, uh, where I teach at Colgate University, upstate New York. Awesome. That is amazing. So how long have you been married? 15 years. Oh, that's awesome. That's wonderful. And three beautiful daughters. So funny. I, I'm, I've been married for 24 years. I have three sons. And I love that you said that they were beautiful and intelligent. That's so, that, I mean, what people say, words matter. So awesome. So let's get into it. Tell us about your work. And specifically, I guess we can start off with the article that you wrote about the 13th Amendment. Yes, so the the article, the argument of the article is that notions of slavery being something in the past or in slavery being really a matter uh, that's already been you know adjudicated and put to rest, and the idea of having modern convict slavery is really an oxymoron or a misnomer at at best. And so we wanted to push back against that, um, especially, given the low profile work that's been done on um, convict slavery, especially in the South, which of course is ironic in a number of ways, because as we lay out in the article, a number of these places are are really a layers of irony where some of these penitentiaries are literally sitting on formal slave plantations and are engaging in some of the same kind of work under the same kind of structure and the same kinds of of logic at play. So imagine for your listeners, um, white men on horseback with whips and a trail of hundreds of, um, you know, deep brown skin men um, walking in chains and picking cotton. And you might think you're either in a Netflix universe or you're watching something uh, about the past, but this is happening right now as we're having this conversation. And it's happening in a number of places. Um, at least a dozen states and more have been um, utilizing these um, convicts uh, in a way that is eerily not too dissimilar to um, familiar images 
of chattel enslavement. Okay, so yeah, that's a pretty big, I mean, it feels like a pretty big argument. And especially in today's world, and you know, we're outside of Dallas, Texas, in a city called Denton. And I feel like if I went up to somebody and told them that, they would like laugh at me. So could you, let's start from a high vantage point of this argument of maybe let's start off with like, what was the 13th amendment? And then maybe can we talk about what convict leasing was? We, we had an episode on convict leasing. So to refresh people, you could go back and listen to that episode, but could you give us a quick reminder of what that is? And then maybe we can start to jump into like that process of how modern, like when someone says modern day convict leasing, that's, or convict slavery or you know, that for me, that is like a big, whoa. And I, I mean, I'm on your team and I feel like I, I, would, I can kind of put those pieces together as somebody who, who is on the show, but could you kind of help the, for a listener who's just coming in and they're just listening to this and they're, they're wanting to learn more, but kind of let's help God hold their hand a little bit as if, and maybe just help remind me personally what all those things were. Sure. So the 13th amendment, of course, um, some of you listeners may remember was part of the um, package of Reconstruction Acts, that is the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, um, that granted in order no slavery or involuntary servitude, uh, of course, um, citizenship and the right to vote, um, the right to vote for men of African ancestry, not women of African ancestry, women, period. So that was part of these acts that came out in 1965 up until Reconstruction was deemed to Um, be dead. So the the amendment essentially says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude um, except as a punishment for crime whereof the parties shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject in its jurisdiction. And so anywhere considered to be legally part of the United States, you cannot have slavery or involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime. Right? And so if you're convicted of a crime, no matter if the crime is real or imaginative, and of course, regarding the um, state of existence for um, people categorized as black, um, if they looked at a white woman, if they walked on the wrong side of the road, if they um, appear to be um, sassy or, or, or have an attitude or look angry or... Um, Basically, if they breathe in a certain way, uh, they could be convicted for a crime. And so um, the law was, and in some cases still is, um, vested in the notion of being white. So a white child you know, essentially could convict. A, <laughs> um, white women often would cry of rape. Um, and, and so living on those proverbial eggshells uh, meant that any ways in which one could be criminalized uh, would make someone a criminal. And then once you're a criminal, then you could, your labor could be enslaved. Now I want to distinguish here chattel, excuse me, um, convict slavery from, from convict leasing. And yes, I did check out the program you had on convict leasing and and it's quite a bit there. Um, We're not arguing. Our argument is not about convict leasing. It's about convict slavery. And this is what I mean. Um, Since the late, 18th century, probably 17th century, really, what became the United States, which is really a phenomenon that happens in the late 17th century. So there is no United States before the late 17th century. So essentially the birth of the nation, um, they use labor of convicts, but this was predominantly a white institutions. And you, and some listeners may say, well, how could that be? Well, A, indigenous peoples for whom lands were um, pillaged and plundered and taken from them they were not considered citizens until 1924, 1925. And that was, of course, the Native American Citizens Act, uh, which means they were non-citizens and therefore uh, they, were, they, they, they essentially could not <laughs> become convict because they were dealt with differently. For people of African ancestry, who was the other category of people under the category of black, they too could not be convicts because they were not citizens. And so essentially slaveholders and their agents and their their long line of people that were deputized by their whiteness to, um, you know, essentially follow through on the law because they were the law, meaning white men were the law and their fantasies were the law, then they did what they could or what they willed to their chattel, right? So once you remove indigenous peoples, once you remove uh, people of African ancestry from the category uh, of, of being convicts, 
that all you really have left are white men. And that's why um, some of your listeners may remember stories and movies about the bounty hunter, right? And, and, and these patrols. Again, they were capturing white men that are alive and for a reward. And so convict, the use of the labor of convicts was really a white institution predominantly. Um, and if, for example, an indigenous or a person of African ancestry was captured, they were usually holding a cell temporarily until their holders could come and essentially uh, retrieve their property. But again, because they were not citizens, they were not considered to be legally, you know, in a sense, we think about prisoners or convicts. So convict slavery really evolves out of that. In other words, convict slavery and chattel slavery coexisted. Mm. And the 13th Amendment, we argue, essentially morphed the two institutions, um, allowing for slavery to continue under the guise of essentially enslaving the labor of convicts, which is quite different from convict leasing, though it's a part of the formula. Yeah. And can you can you help someone like me? So I'm thinking when they wrote that 13th Amendment and they specifically worded it that way, were they thinking of like, hey, how can we change? How can we continue slavery? Or were they just like well-meaning people and they're just really like we should just enslave criminals? Like, Can you help? Like, what what are your thoughts there? Like, it, was that on purpose to continue Sure. And that's, a, that's an excellent question. It's a question uh, we had in going into the you know, research you know, for this piece. And this is essentially what we came to, that essentially, you know, um, this is not a morality test or ethics test. Um, it's really a function of, of, of power and the engine that drives that power, which, of course, is labor that produces surplus, that produces capital. And so um, essentially... You know, that question you ask, a great question, by the way, it's rooted in this conflict of tension in Europe history that's illustrated by the 13th Amendment. So in short order, some states approved the amendment in 1865. Others like Delaware, Mississippi, New Jersey, which we consider to be, except for Mississippi, northern states, liberal states. And of course, the, the imaginary line between north and south is really just that, it's a fiction. Right. And so they rejected the, the amendment. Um, because what was at stake was free labor. And so, um, you know, when the United States embraced the idea of freedom, um, you know, it was economically powered by slave labor. And so when the crafters of the um, Constitution, the, of course, the Bill of Rights Constitution, um, the Articles of the Declaration of Independence, you know, from, from Britain, um, free labor and slave labor were always, you know, on the table, even the Civil War. Um, if you read the constitutions of places like Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, it was all about slave labor. And so, again, labor is the engine that actually pushes this vehicle called the United States forward. And so that was at stake. And that's why some states accepted, some states, you know, reluctantly and certainly vehemently rejected the amendment. And so the net result was that um, the nation, um, you know, essentially is, you know, the nation has 4% of the planet's population but 22% of it's incarcerated. Think about that. Oh, yeah. Right? A fourth of the world's <laughs> prisoners are in a place that only has uh, about or less than 4% of the you know 7 billion plus people on this planet. So the need for some form of free or very, very low cost um, of labor uh, is crucial um, to, you know, this amendment. And that's why that amendment was really a, a very tense and, and, and the contradiction, the hypocrisy or whatever you want to call it, um, is really packaged in that amendment because it was a compromise. Much like the civil war, you know, conclusion was a compromise, much like the states who, you know, um, you know, returned to the union, it was a compromise. And so you have all these compromises that hinge or revolve around, the notion of slave and free labor. Yeah. Let's start to tie the, okay, so knowing that, and I'm just trying to think of free labor now, like when I think of incarcerated people, I I mean, I guess I know that they do some, there are some labor programs and stuff, but can you help try to tie that through line from, you know, post-emancipation to today? What what is that? What does that actually look like? Well, and I want to also... Uh, point to 
the history of some of these con- companies that utilize that benefit from convict lease- leasing and how many of the companies um have a long standing history in the country that goes back to enslavement and how the cycle how it's recycled how enslavement is recycled can you also speak to that dynamic as well sure excellent um so uh, i would refer the uh, listeners um to um, a book, but more so there's a documentary based on it. Um, it's by a journalist from Atlanta, and it's called um, um, Slavery by Another Name. Yeah. And it came on PBS, PBS documentary, mm-hmm. as well as uh, is a book, um, again, based on this. Uh, it's a white journalist uh, out of Atlanta, did some really good work, uh, and that's really accessible. Uh, and so uh, folks can check that out. Um, now, Douglas Black, the argument, correct? Yes, yes, mm-hmm, indeed, mm-hmm. indeed. And the book is the book is better than documentary, by the yes. way. But for those who, who who want the you know sort of Twitter version um, and visual version, the right. documentary is is pretty decent. Uh, and I say decent because it deals with the questions of labor. Um, one of the ironies of Reconstruction, um, and this is going back to the first question. One of the ironies of Reconstruction is that Reconstruction is not taught really in U.S. schools from K through 12. And even as a university professor, <laughs> unless you're in a history course that these are U.S. history, you don't, really, you, you don't really touch it. And there's a reason why. Reconstruction was deemed to be a failure because it was a success. What do I mean by that? You see, due to the Reconstruction Acts, which the Northern um, politicians had forced upon a losing South, as, as, as it were, that his Confederates had to essentially concede to the terms of losing the Civil War, um, there are two major takeaways that happen. One is this. Um, some of you might remember the very contentious and compromised that came out of the elections of 1877, 1876-77, between Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel J. Tilden. One a Democrat, one a Republican. Now, I'm going to remind the listeners that Democrats in the 19th century uh, are the Republicans of today. And the Republicans of the 19th century are the Democrats of today. Um, yeah. There's a flip, and that flip happened during the, reign of, during the tenure of FDR in the 1930s. But if you if you stay with me there, so the Democrats, Southern Democrats, um, and the Northern Republicans had a compromise because the election was contested. And the compromise essentially meant this. It was, okay, um, the Southern white Democrats, that is the Republicans of today, um, said, look, we'll give you the White House if in turn you, A, remove the federal troops from the South, leaving the newly emancipated people of African ancestry without protection. B, um, you essentially return the lands that were confiscated by the Union Army to the former slaveholders, Mm right? Right. So, so they, they, they were restituted. They got their land and, and, and their estates and plantations and everything back. Um, and three, it all, that compromise did this. It said, look, and by the way, this, this is actually um, characterized in you know, some of the 19th century newspapers like Harper's um, and others where um, there's famous political cartoons where the northern you know, financiers are shaking hands with the um, southern um, clan members and uh, others, bitches saying this in the tagline that uh, the United States is a white republic, is a white man country. Mm-hmm. And they're stepping on, on the neck of, the, uh, of an African-American man, right? So that visual sort of captures that moment. That compromise said, look, uh, we as whites may differ on certain tactical and, strat- and certain strategies, but you know, by and large, you know, we agree on one thing. We're, we're, we're in control. This is a white republic, white country. We are the law, uh, and so on and so forth. And so that compromise essentially meant an end to Reconstruction. And here's a second takeaway. Reconstruction ended not because it was a failure. The South made it a failure, and therefore that's when the Klan, the White Knights, and all these white terrorist groups emerged to then feast on these vulnerable um, and you know without assets because people of African ancestors couldn't take advantage of his opportunities like the Homestead Act, because they had no capital, they couldn't therefore buy land, and therefore they had to what? Sharecrop, because they had to go back 
to the plantations to continue to labor. Again, the theme of free, low-cost labor. And so that second takeaway is really that the South was rebuilt because of African Americans. There were over 1,500 African American men that took office. Um, some were actually the vice governor in the South. And they're the ones whose programs are rebuilding roads and schools and businesses that rebuild the South. And of course, if you are a white nationalist, you can't have that storyline. How can these, you know, really recently emancipated chattel be the one to rebuild the South? That's a story you can't have. And so Reconstruction had to be deemed a failure when, mm-hmm. because it was a success. Right. And that's the irony. And that's, I think that those are the two big takeaways, that compromise and, and the irony of the success is what led to a ramping up of these white terrorist groups matched by convict leasing, matched by a morphing or a combination of chattel enslavement with convict slavery. And that's when you see the prison numbers by 1900, they, sh- they shoot up. Right. And they continue to go from there. Um, and so that's sort of the, the short version of, 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 I think, some of the key momentous events and takeaways from that Reconstruction period up until you get to the early 20th century. And so it, it, basically what I'm hearing you saying is that after the carnage of the Civil, Civil War, brother against brother, um, it, there's a reframing and a recrafting the narrative basically in the name of white solidarity. Because even though we have North and South, there's still racist ideologies, even with the North and even with abolitionists. And at the end of the day, it was sustaining, it was to sustain white solidarity, um, which allowed, which allowed the South to, to repaint the narrative. It's like, okay, we won the war, the North won the war, but we'll let you say, Whatever you want to say happen, and you know you guys can erect <laughs> Confederate statues all over the country, you know just this per- this era where it's like we have to get our footing back and um uh establish white solidarity because we still can't let b- black people get out of control, and we still need free labor yes more more, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if, if, if that's a summary, that's a wonderful job, um, more, more or less. The, 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 and, and then that's really the, the sort of upshoot of the compromises. I mean, they're, they're made uh, in the interest of saying, look, this is a white republic. And that there's a notion of being a slave of the state. And this comes from Virginia, which, by the way, was the largest number of enslaved Africans um, in that state, um, you know, declared that essentially convicts were uh, basically socially dead, and this is their language, and were slaves of the state. That a slave could do, I mean, the state could do what they want uh, with them as chattel. And just to add to that, you know, th- there was an important um, international meeting in Geneva, Switzerland, in the 1920s. Um, and at this meeting, um, it um, essentially said, look, uh, we need to outlaw um, slavery in all forms, right, in, in the world. And, you know, effectively, the convention, you know, came up with this, <clears throat> excuse me, came up with this um, declaration, you know, that the right of ownership, right, that is to own people, um, with, with the, basically the, the treaty, international treaty, um, it's called the Slavery Convention, Mm-hmm. Uh, and anyone can go to the United Nations website and, and search for it and find it. But the treaty was created in 1926, and it basically defines slavery as a status or condition of a person over whom any or all of the power is attached to the right of ownership. And that's really the key, right of ownership, right? So it's um, sharecropping, right of ownership, convict leasing, right of ownership, yeah. chattel slavery, right of ownership, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's really the key clause there. And so basically right of ownership means, you know, in, in, in you know, plain language, it means buying, selling, using, profiting, um, transferring, or destroying that person because you have right of ownership. And this is the legal definition of slavery that is held up by international courts since 1926. Now, three years later, the U.S. government ratifies a treaty, right? They sign on to it and you say, yes, mm-hmm. you know, no more slavery. But there is a caveat and the language of the caveat is eerily familiar. So... The U.S. government signed on to that definition 
uh, and signed on to the treaty three years later. But this is what they did, that is the U.S. government. They opposed forced or compulsory labor except as a punishment for crime for which the person has been duly convicted. Sounds familiar? Essentially, <laughs> the government doubles down on the 13th Amendment exception clause. And this is in the treaty. So folks can go and check it out themselves. And this is 1929, 1930, folks. This is not, you know, ancient history. And so the U.S. government doubles down uh, on this in a moment where they could have said, yes, we're on board, no forms of slavery, convict or otherwise. And so the U.S. government's opposition, you know, to the 13th Amendment, I think is striking because 64 years later, um, you know, that amendment, um, you know, essentially the government affirmed the use of prison uh, for forced and convict slavery. And that's how we get those, um, you know, those prisons in places like um, Georgia, Florida, Arkansas, uh, Louisiana, and your Texas. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and I want to talk about the, I'm going to circle back around to these companies because it, 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 it's all about the mighty dollar for sure. And I would like to dig into the numbers um, the millions, the trillions, the gazillions of money that um, prison for profit, uh, privatized prison, convict leasing. Like, I, I, I want to, um, can you dive into that? And again, just the companies that are taking advantage. Like, there are so many companies that are household names that everybody, you know, we patronize these businesses and they participate in and benefit from prison labor. True thing. And, and I'll start probably with the states um, just to give some context to your uh, wonderful listeners. So basically over 20 states uh, and the numbers, by the way, are going to keep growing because many of these states have agreements with those companies that you um, poke at. And so over 20 states include that exception clause from the 13th Amendment, from the ratification of the Geneva Slavery Convention in their state constitution. So this is a matter of law. Um, and by the way, courts has been very, um, including the Supreme Court, have been very hands-off on, on trying to resolve this, again, because really what's at stake is, is clearly more important. So nonetheless, over 20 states, you know, include this exception clause uh, in their own state constitutions. About 38 of them, you know, have programs, they're called, in which for-profit companies, you know, essentially uh, run factories, farms, um, plantations, um, growing fruits, vegetables, cotton, <laughs> um, and other kinds of sort of cash crops and goods by prisoners. And prisoners perform everything from picking cotton to manufacturing goods to essentially fighting forest fires. As some of you listeners, some of your listeners, excuse me, may remember of the um, ravaging forest fires in California, right? Um, yep. There were prisoners on those front lines. Um, you know, not released, not paroled, but fighting, fighting, you know, the, the, these forest fires uh, alongside the salaried, you know, firefighters that were there. And so some of the big name companies that many of your listeners will recognize are Dell uh, mm -hmm. Computers, um, Boeing, which, of course, some of you know, um, has massive contracts with the U.S. government. Um, they include AT and T. I mean, they, I mean, they, so whether it's telecom, whether it's aer, you know aeronautics, or uh, or it, it is um, you know computer. It also includes um, you know Visa, Mastercard. Um, in fact, you'll find that there are these uh, in prisons. There are these call centers that it is not surprising or um, a shock that a number of these call centers, if you're calling for customer service, are being routed through, um, you know, prisoners um, who are in uh, in prison and they have on headsets and microphones and, they have, mm -hmm. and they're managing call centers. Uh, and so it's, it's sort of an in-outsourcing of labor in the country, mm -hmm. but it's outsourced. Um, and so they range the gambit, they mean the companies range the gambit in terms of the productive force that, that convicts, um, provide and for the inmates in terms of what they get out of it. In some cases, inmates are paid less than a penny, if you can quantify that an hour. Um, many essentially who serve the sentences leave prison in debt, and, and that was a you know one of the um, you know shocking parts from our research. I say, how is that possible? <laughs> uh, they leave prison in debt because whatever income that they do make any, you know, um, you know, pays for subsistence. But then of course. Um, 
when they um, leave prison for those who have served their terms, they essentially, they're working without protections of either the Fair Labor Standards Act or the National Labor Act, so any labor act. So they have none of those protections as laborers, even though they are laborers, right? Working for legitimate for-profit companies. You know, wow. So there's a number of, of sort of, of, of innuendos and ironies packaged in here where, and you say, well, for from the point of view of these companies, inmates are, are the perfect workers. They won't call out sick. They won't strike. They won't ask for parental leave. They're, they're, they're sedentary, right? They're, they're stuck mm-hmm. in a sentence. And so to, to these companies and, and, of course, the public that, of course, um, doesn't say anything about it because – you know, there's a referendum, right? There's no moratorium. Um, the public has a role in this. And so the public, you know, hasn't, you know, um, as far as I'm aware, you know, made any particular case to say, hey, we need to have, you know, um, not a proverbial conversation, but, you know, something has to be done in terms of what we expect of people um, that commit legitimate crimes and have to serve their sentence, right? What do we expect of them? Uh, is it the case, uh, for example, in places like Sweden or Northern Europe, where they have a different theory about what should happen to convicts, right? That it should be about rehabilitation or what's our theory of, you know, uh, convicts and what should be their, um, you know, the cost of their crime while incarcerated, right? Those kinds of debates haven't happened yet. And so the public has a place. And so until that happens, I mean, the, these corporations and in partnership with states and, of course, the federal government, think of this triangle, federal government, states and corporations are, are literally making a killing on the dead and dying you know, laborers um, in these places. And, of course, COVID has ravaged prisons and prisoners. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as I'm, as I'm looking this up, I mean, even uh, American Airlines and Avis, if you call their call centers... Like you can. That's what I just read. I, yeah, like I'm blown away. That will answer your phone, and, and they're not identified as that. You just assume they're normal people. But then, other ones: uh, J.C. Penney and Kmart, Fidelity Investments, uh, Victoria's Secret, Verizon, Sprint, Starbucks. Some of the cups that are made in prisons: Walmart, uh, Wendy's, McDonald's. Um, also, in the, our convict leasing episode, we talked about how in some southern states the convict leasing system. Um, was like a quarter of the state budget in some of those southern states, the money that they made from leasing out convicts. Or um, the Daily uh, podcast from New York Times did an episode on um, women who are convict laborers fighting fires in California. That would be a good one for listeners to listen to. But just like these uh, prisoners who are basically essentially bribed with like you can get out if you go and risk your life fighting fires getting paid almost nothing but it's just like an alternative to just being in this concrete cell and so these women will go and uh many of them will like that means a dangerous job that like some of them die um and uh all of this like i i mean i imagine an alternate america where we didn't have all these companies that have this incentive to perpetuate mass incarceration. Like companies actually do a lot of advocacy and a lot of activism and a lot of good when they have the incentive to do it. Like companies are powerful. They can actually affect law. They have all these lobbyists in Washington, D.C. But all these companies have this bribe to maintain and perpetuate mass incarceration. And so you don't hear them pushing back against it. Like there's no sustained national outcry against the fact that we have 22% of the world's prisoners and against the injustice and inhumanity of our prison system. And I think so much of that um, it like ties back into this. Yeah, that there's just this, this bribe that America from the 13th Amendment on, we left this bribe in place that like, we can, and, and you see this operating all, all throughout history, where, like uh, you, you alluded to the black codes earlier, how, uh, like that incentive to criminalize people led to all these false charges, and I, I mean you can even see in the convict leasing era that the prison rolls would swell whenever the cotton picking season was coming up. It's like, okay, we need all this cotton picking labor. And all of a sudden you see like a, a, a swell in the number of arrests. Quotas. Yeah, where they were like arresting quotas of people for the labor. So is this like twisted uh, bribe that we left on ourselves and that has uh, contorted our whole system and led to this place where 
uh, black people are stigmatized as, or are criminalized, stigmatized as criminal, um, and, and that arose because of this flaw in the 13th Amendment. Well, and to add to that, many of these companies um, participate in the in this age of commercial wokeness. So they'll have Juneteenth <laughs> displays, and they will sell Black Lives Matter t-shirts, and, you know, they will pander to, um, you know, to African Americans. I was in, you know, Bed Bath, um, not Bed Bath Beyond, but Bath and Body Works, which I don't know if they... Uh, not a sponsor. Yeah, I don't know. But, you know, they had a whole Black History, you know, display of candles, and I'm just... Turned off by that because at the end of the day, they're profiting and and how does it benefit the black community? But when you think about these companies that are taking advantage of prison for profit, but they will do, they'll have the performative work of justice that they're supporting, you know, black, uh, Black Lives Matter or they're supporting, you know, all these things that concern the black community while at the same time benefiting and continuing to participate in a system of oppression and criminalization of black people. It is mind-boggling. Indeed. And if, if, I, if I can, uh, um, I'll say two um, quick additives um, to that. So a state like Georgia, you know, ended convict leasing in 1907 and um, immediately the, 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 effect with severe economic blow to several industries, including, you know, sort of brick and mining companies, coal companies um, that relied on access to cheap labor or, you know, essentially free labor in in many cases. Um, And for Georgia, like other Southern states, um, you know, many collapsed, you know, or had significant losses. And so, um, you know, there, there is certainly the, um, again, the, the, that partnership between states and corporation um, that, that has endured. And the second, really, to make a pitch to your listeners that uh, though I'm referencing or we're referencing, you know, particular moments and places from, the, you know, that foreign land called the past, um, this is very much, you know, ever present. So just give an example, um, the largest, some of the largest, you know, production prisons um, for cotton are in Arkansas. And the U.S. is the third largest producer of cotton globally because of that, right behind India and China. Um, ironically, at a time when, you know, the U.S. media, um, and I'm generalizing, um, tends to frame China, India, or China as, as, as violators of labor laws. <laughs> right. When at the same time, and we're talking about right now, um, the U.S. is right behind as the third global producer of cotton in the world. And it's because of places like the penitentiaries in Arkansas, which are the largest producers of cotton from the country. And not only cotton, but rice in Arkansas. Rice, there's a little Mm -hmm. town called Stuttgart that my my husband is from, and it's the rice capital of the world. Um, If you listen you said you listened to the episode on convict leasing. My mother-in-law, Ben Ferdine Smith, um, was in prison for a, a murder that she did not commit. And she worked in convict leasing. Um, and, and what we also don't talk about is that there are companies that will use... Well, we kind of talked about this with the fires in, Cal- in California, but they'll use uh, prisoners to do dangerous, dangerous work, like in dangerous buildings and, you know, where there's um, harmful... Asbestos. Yeah, or... that type of thing, which that's what my mother-in-law, she worked in one, of, in, in one of those buildings for a period of time before she got cancer and passed away. And she was 20 years, she died 20 years serving um, a life sentence. So what you're saying is very real to me and my family. Like, we, we've lived it. Um, and in trying to get her out of the system and appealing her case was it it was just it was it was hell so and we're still trying to clear her name but yeah arkansas is a a huge offender i would love to as we kind of start to land the plane you know everything you've been saying i am like 
I think I maybe had a little bit of an idea just from some of the stuff we've covered, but I'm just almost, I mean, I'm not in shock, but I am like, I don't know, maybe my expectations are just too high for (laughs) our country at times, but can you maybe talk a little bit more about some of those modern examples? And then I would love to hear your thoughts before we kind of start to land the plane of just like, why, why does it matter for me, this middle class white guy in suburbia, you know, what is it, how is it affecting me? Like what, what I, you know, it, it seems like most people are just unaware of it, but then when we become aware of it, it seems really easy to just pretend it's not there and just don't deal with it, which does things to us, I guess, emotionally and stuff. But, but yeah, I would love for you to tie kind of some more modern examples into like, how is it affecting our, like my life, our lives? And specifically, how, how do we push back against something that's so, that's just a, America's fabric? How do, we, how do we push back against this system? I'll start with the first um, question then move on to the, the latter one in terms of pushing back. And so um, I don't think, I think w- w- one of the, one of the, um, the trap is, 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 is to think that, uh, is to think as an individual, you know, what can I do? Because these are not individual matters. These, these right. are structural yes. um, in, in many ways. It's sort of tied into sort of, sort of the, the unconscious um, you know, um, framing, uh, as, as, um, you know, the, the host mentioned a moment ago, the sort of unconscious framing of, of the United States, which by the way, uh, in many ways has its protective layer of not making people question, <laughs> right? Because right. if you question, then you, then, then essentially the, the, and this is, this is long before cancel culture, right? Where if you question, then you're unpatriotic, right? So in other words, is a, is a, is a tying or tethering, uh, of of asking the right questions with being essentially unpatriotic or you're not down with us. And so I think first and foremost for everyone, you know, wh- whether you believe you're white or otherwise, it is, is, is really to ask the right questions. Um, mm-hmm. and, and here's the reason why. Um, this is what we're sort of dealing with. You know, um, as, as someone that, that, that you know, teaches history, you know, th- this, this, a third of U.S. adults cannot pass a U.S. citizen exam. Most K-12 students have a poor grasp of U.S. history, uh, as recent surveys have shown, but so do U.S. lawmakers. Hmm. In fact, there's a billionaire named David Rubenstein who undertook this project to teach politicians U.S. history. Now think about that. K-12 politicians, right? <laughs> And U.S. citizens all have a poor grasp of U.S. history. Wow. Right? So if one wants to have a place to start, and there's no shortage of places to start, right, in plural, places to start, um, it is really the fundamental. And it's not about civics, by the way, right? It's not about patriotism or civics. It's about some some baseline fundamentals that that is, that is not shared. And, of course, in your home state of Texas, there's been – a lot of reframing of curricular <laughs> to tell a certain narrative, which is early familiar of the Reconstruction era, uh, yeah. in many ways. And so, because and, and here's what I'm saying: I'm not judging that move in, in 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 the state of Texas. What I am saying is that that kind of move and gesture is precisely because what's at stake is so important, right? That yeah. is, telling a certain story is so important. That's why there's a fight in the um, in, in in the in the legislature. <laughs> about what is and what is not deemed to be fit for a curriculum, state curriculum, right? Um, so I'm talking about the fight. The fight over it is suggests to me why it's important to ask the right questions, why it's important yep. to um, push back, why it's important to adjunct as parents what children are learning in the schools or being taught in, in schools, uh, what they consume through TV and, and, and media, whether it's TikTok, Twitter, or other kinds of media, just really to say, hey, ask the right questions. And that being fearless about asking the right questions doesn't mean you're reneging on your citizenship because that, that's sort of the, the, one of the roadblocks thrown up. Well, you're not a, you're not, you're not patriotic. You're not a citizen. You know what I mean? It's, anyway, go back to Africa. Those kinds right. of things that people uh, when they do that. And so um, I think first and foremost is really to deal with the reality as it is in terms of how poor of a grasp people in this country have of the, the basics about um, how the country came to be. 
Um, I think that's one very fertile ground to to address. And I think that's beyond, you know, whoever people believe they, 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 they are, because if you share a particular space that is a, a country, then everyone is implicated, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that doesn't mean the weight is equal, because it's not. Right? Um, because, you know, people after answer didn't create white supremacy, so it's not their burden to carry, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying the weight is equal. What I am saying is that um, I'm suggesting that the 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 onus you know is 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 across the board and in terms of the sort of concrete things that um you know people can do um the, the, it, we we have to think not individually but structurally and we have to think um um systemically and it's not simply about for example having um you know either a anti-racist workshop um, or, um, you know, implicit bias training, those things tend not to work based on the numbers because, again, it's not about individuals. Right. And, I, mm-hmm. and, and, and if that makes any sense, um, you know, that's, you know, though there's an industry, by the way, regarding these things, and some people are getting very rich off these workshops and training sessions, yes. but they don't work because it's not about individuals. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I dare to say that some of these matters are above our pay grade because they're not about individual action and individual morality and ethics. So my background in undergrad was in economics. And so just to like explain a little bit of the kind of strategic dynamics behind that idea of individual action or like collective action, um, just to tease that out a little bit, like if imagine a scenario, uh, speaking to the audience, imagine a scenario where there's, uh, a, you know, three main companies in an industry and uh, they're deciding whether or not to use this cheap form of labor. Um, what's going to happen is if the companies, like if one of the companies individually decides I'm going to just do the right thing and not use this cheap labor, then the result is that the other two companies become more profitable than the company that's doing the right thing. And so the company that's doing the right thing has to charge more to make the same profit, and then they get a smaller share of the market, and the company's doing the wrong thing, they grow faster, and they can scale faster, and they can get new economies of scale and more investors because they show more profit, so they can get more capital. And so the companies that do the wrong thing actually win in the end and they grow bigger and bigger until basically now there's only two companies in the in the market and they're doing the wrong thing. And so that's like the idea of like there are systems where individual action can't be the solution because by definition it creates this situation like the a name for it is the race to the bottom where like the ones who do the worst thing actually win in the end, have a growing share of control. And so when we talk about systems and that we can't just individually, like like some of the laissez fair people want to be like, let's just let the market handle everything. But the, there are certain, sometimes that works. Sometimes markets are really powerful and effective. But there are certain dynamics in our economy or in the world that individual action simply cannot address or solve. And for those, we need like solutions that actually fix the system. Um, and so then how do we do that? Like as individuals, we can't do that. But what we can do is like be an advocate for some of those solutions. Uh, to land this plane, just wanted to invite you to speak directly to the listener. Um, what are some things they can take away from this conversation? And how can they learn from it to uh, love better, to be better people as they engage the world? Sure. So to sort of bring um, some of these ideas together, I would actually challenge the the listeners um, by not giving them a solution which would suggest that things are going to be easy and therefore you know fixable, as in contributing money to this organization or joining the right. picket line. Right. I don't want to give any illusions uh, because here's the, I think what's at stake and has always been at stake. Uh, what's been at stake and continues to be at stake uh, is the narrative that frames our, our consciousness and even our unconsciousness about uh, what this country is and is not, and the very coercive power used to build this narrative and the nation that stands behind it. And so um, we're facing, and I think have to face, 
deeply rooted cultural and social norms um, that require confronting those histories and concentrations of power uh, that make them viable. And so um, given those political and economic imperatives at play, um, free prison labor or convicts you know, labor will persist in the foreseeable future, really, you know, leaving, um, you know, in doubt and, and open, you know, for action, this very idea of American freedom. So effectively, all the folks that uh, flag wavers and drape themselves in the flag and, um, you know, pound their chest um, is, is to, you know, take a look at themselves um, and take a look at their, uh, you know, at, at their histories um, because that, that's, that's really, you know, what, what's at stake here. Um, and then people can decide from within, you know, uh, how, what kinds of actions or, or, or not, you know, they, they deem fit. Because I think the, the, the trap is to, is, is to want to give a solution when this is not a quadratic equation that can be solved. If it was, it would have been solved a long time ago. This is not a debate that could be solved by, you know, sharp arguments. If it was, then it would have been solved a long time ago. Um, right. the, the, the function um, of, of power. And as James Baldwin said, one of my favorite writers, um, you know, um, you know, white is a metaphor for power. And so um, the people who have um, economic, political and other kinds of power won't relinquish it. And so you can't debate your way out of that relinquishing. You have to confront it. And so there's a certain implicit level of, of, um, of you know, confronting that. And that's up to the people. Not me. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been a wow. Well, let us know how, how can we support you, our listeners and us? What can we do to support you in the work that you're doing? Well, I'm, I think about that one. Um, I'm usually not, not a you know, person, salesperson for myself. Uh, oh, but, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I don't, I don't really, uh, I'm not really into that. But uh, I'm sharing um, with you all in the, in the chat um, my, my website that has, uh, you know, a lot of my work. Um, awesome. The media, there's, there's blogs, there are books and other kinds of things that, you know, people can check out. That sounds great. We can do that. And then, of course, there's a contact form there. So if folks want to reach out, uh, I'm, I'm very responsive. Um, and so, yeah, if I can be of service, then I will be. Thank you so That's much. That's great. Hey, I've, before we before you leave, and we'll just go. I was just I was kind of wondering, like from you from your perspective, how would you word it? I wonder what you would say to someone that is just like, why, why, why do it in the first place? Why should, why fix it? What's the reason? Like, why does the work that you're doing? I'm kind of wondering just why you got into history. You're teaching history. You uh, why um, why even come onto a podcast like this? Uh, I'm not like uh, I'm. This is an antagonizing question. I'm just kind of generally <laughs> interested in like what what drives you to you know teach things like this and um, come on a podcast and talk about things like what, what what's what's driving you? Sure, that's a great question. Um, well, it's not one driver because you know those those um, things that I that I engage in, whether it's teaching or you know um, you know hanging out with you all. Uh, or other kinds of work, they have different drivers. Um, mm -hmm. My core driver is, is, is ancestry and my family. So uh, I became, uh, you know, I got into history through my family history when I was an undergrad. I was a computer science major when I first started undergrad at 17, 18, and then I switched over um, to history, particularly history of African descended people. Um, and um, it was ancestry. You know, I, I wanted to dig in more about the constellation of people, you know, to which I was born into. And um, family for me is sort of this, you know, metaphor, as, as is true for the theorist um, Franz Fanon, that the family is sort of a, a, a metaphor for the nation. And so um, family is the kind of thing where you are born into or adopted into um, a group of people who you otherwise probably wouldn't choose if you had the choice. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you develop certain obligations and bonds and, and connections. And, and, and that's really, really a, a way, of, a, a different way for me of thinking about nation building, right? Um, but you know, as we know, families have tensions, right? Families have disagreements. They have fights. Um, they fracture. They split apart, you know, or they, they say, hey, it's worth staying together. So 
to me, that 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 is that is um, what fascinates me about you know human history because human history is about one thing, which is human action, mm-hmm. and um, it's it's all the things that I've mentioned a moment ago that that that's really that drives. Um, and for me, it is really doing my part to um, flush out um, what you know it appears that people are either missing or or or, or need to be aware of. So they can be informed as as they as they act out their lives as human beings, right? Um, to push back again, you know those narratives that that are that are serving you know certain segments of a nation. Just the same way that you know there's certain narratives in my family that serve certain segments of my family, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that I found out to be untrue after further digging, right? So, wow. if we think about the nation as, as as through the lens of let's say family. That's how I got into this was really doing that kind of deep digging, and you find things that are that are um, uncomfortable, that are that are, are disgusting, but also it's yeah. some things that are beautiful, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then and then you have a choice, and so um, you know the, the, the choices that that the nation that is the United States has faced in in basically each century. So in the 17th century, it was a choice as to whether to continue with debt servitudes. And let that die away, and really build something that that was representative. Um, and it didn't. They chose to essentially double down, so that the plant, the indentured servants, became the new planters, and that those planters decided to um, chose to, when they had a choice to do otherwise, uh, import enslaved um, captive African peoples who became enslaved. And then the century later, 1770s, continental congresses, there's a choice. In the British world, which was the United States was part of, you know, Britain is, is winding down on enslavement. You know, the, the abolitionists, Africans, and, um, you know, white Europeans like Wilberforce and others, Clarkson, they're pushing to abolish slavery. So in the British world, people are actually pushing to abolish slavery. And what the United States do? They said, Mm-mm, we're going to keep it. <laughs> right. 1870, century later, you know, civil war is about slavery, period. Read the constitution of these uh, seceding states. Again, they have a choice, double down, right? 13th Amendment Clause, convict slavery, convict leasing, all those things morph into, you know, um, what's being popularly called mass incarceration and so on. And then a century later, 1960s and 70s, Vietnam War, urban revolts, riots, um, like power, you know, liberation movements, oh, a wrecking the moment again. What happens? Doubling down. <laughs> Crack cocaine follows, uh, Reaganism follows, draconian laws follows, the, the poor are criminalized, you know. And so at these century marks, there's been choices and the choices reflect, the choices compound, meaning they layer what happened before. And so uh, that's why I said, you know, I, 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 I reticent the fact of telling anyone what to do or what to solve because it's not, you know, I'm, uh, again, a quadratic equation to be solved. You know, it's more of a confronting of those things that have built up. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you are looking for more information on what we discussed, take a look at the show notes or go to blackhistoryforwhitepeople.com. If you'd like to play a supportive role in the podcast, you can support our work for $5 a month at patreon.com backslash blackhistoryforwhitepeople. On our next episode, we will be talking with Dr. Tara Green about respectability in the black culture. We'll leave you with this quote from Booker T. Washington. Success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which he has overcome while trying to succeed.